starts the weekend. All right. Um, I have a moment. Um, today is kind of a, a nice, relaxing day for me. But anyways, um, let me go. Oh, shoot. Okay. Let me just go ahead and get, and get into this because um, I have a lot to do today. Um, but I just wanted to take a moment, especially for the newer dog groomers out there. If you're, you know what, I think this would apply to more than just dog groomers. I think no matter what field you're, you're in, no matter what career you're about to start, uh, no matter what your, um, what do they call that, your occupation? No, not, yeah. what do they call that? Shoot, anyways, <laughs> whatever, whatever it is that you do. I think that this, these three ideas will apply to pretty much anyone, but especially if you're a new dog groomer, I, I wanted to share some ideas that I wish I had gotten and really digested when I first started grooming, when I first started as a dog groomer. I think this would have saved me a lot of time, a lot of headache, a lot of misunderstandings and um, kind of disagreements that you know happened when I was out there just trying to make a big splash in the industry, make get my name out there, you know, I'm gonna make something of myself, you know, it's like, what, I, make what, you know, who cares, but anyways, um, these ideas came to me as I started searching for answers, as I started searching for how can I actually get better, because I get, I got so tired of um, just running up against the wall and not, not knowing how to get past these obstacles, failing my business when I first opened up in, in Buckhead, you know, that was a huge hit to my, to, to my life, to my ego, my pride, everything. I was devastated. Um, and that was the first time I started looking into reading books to try to get some ideas to help change my life. Because one of the ideas that I got that really helped me was Jim Rohn saying, oh, no, it was Seth Godin. He said, there's no Prince Charming out there coming to save the day. There's no hero coming to help you. You have, to find, you have to find the answers yourself and find the strength within yourself to become your own hero, to become the hero of your own story because there's no hero out there coming to save the day for you. And that's when I started thinking, okay, well then I need better ideas because the set of beliefs and the ideas that I was working with, the world is against me. Um, you know, the world's not fair. People are gonna, you know, like, I think Albert Einstein said it best when he said that we all have to decide for ourselves. The most important questions, most important question we have to ask ourselves is, do I live in a friendly or hostile universe? Because he's saying that whatever our answer is, it's going to be true. What, if we believe we live in a friendly universe, that's going to be our experience. If you believe you live in a hostile universe, that's also going to be your experience. We have it all here. It just depends on what you want to focus on, right? And how you want your life to go. Anyways, so um, these are the three ideas. I'm just going to throw it out there, and then I'm going to get into it. The three ideas, just to save people time, if you want to just get the three points and get out of here because you have a lot to do on Saturday, I get it. Number one is become a four-leaf clover. Become unique. Become different, you know? And that's the thing. It's like um, a lot of times we find ourselves comparing to ourselves to everyone else, you know, trying to fit in you know, with the cool crowd and, and trying to maybe, um, you know, get connections with people thinking that that's going to help us in our own career. And it's not. The, the idea of a four leaf clover, um, because when I started looking for four leaf clovers and I found a lot, what I realized is that it didn't matter how big or small they were, or even if they were damaged, it didn't matter. As long as they had that extra leaf, I was gonna pick them out of the crowd, right? And I remember seeing these um, three leaf clovers one time, huge, impressive. They were so big and towering above the rest of the clovers, but they only have three leaves. You know what I'm saying? They were bigger and more beautiful, you know, but they weren't really special. They weren't unique because they didn't grow that extra leaf, right? Um, so if you, wanna, if you wanna stand out of the crowd, if you wanna be picked from out of the crowd, you, if you want people to come and search for you, you have to grow that fourth leaf. Doesn't matter if you come from a long line of four leaf clovers. Doesn't matter if you're surrounded by four leaf clovers. If you did not put in the effort and the time to grow that extra leaf on, for yourself, you're not gonna get picked. Doesn't matter if your best friend is a four leaf clover. They'll get picked and you'll be left behind. 
Um, number two, communicate values, not strengths, right? You don't want to say things like, um, I'm better than so-and-so, you know, I won so many awards, I did this. These are all strength statements. And yes, they are impressive, but it's not what gets somebody to actually trust and value your service and want to continually use your services, you know, be a loyal client of yours, be a loyal customer. Um, a lot of times it's not because you're the biggest and best in the round. Um, it's because of your values, what you believe. So um, making statements of what you believe is much better than what you can do or what you've done or what you're gonna do, you know? For example, Martin Luther King Jr.'s speech, I have a dream, right? It was the I have a dream speech, not the I have a plan speech, right? Because he, he was telling us what he valued, what he believes in. And people, people bought into that. You know, we, 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 we feel that from a heart level, right? If he would have told us about everything that he's accomplished, everything he's done, and what he's gonna do, if it was the I have a plan speech, we probably wouldn't even talk about it today, right? Martin Luther King Jr.'s speech was so special because it was I have a dream, not I have a plan. Um, number three, project competence, right? You don't want to seem like you don't know what the things that you're supposed to know as a professional, right? One of the reasons why I took the coloring course on how to dye dogs and color them, not because I'm ever going to do it. I, I'm never going to offer that service because my style is different. I, I want to highlight the natural beauty of that dog. And you will be shocked how incredibly difficult it is to get a dog to look naturally beautiful, right? It's incredibly hard work and it takes a long time, but that's my thing. But it's a lot different saying, I don't offer that service compared to, I don't know how. As a professional dog groomer, I don't wanna say I don't know how, or I don't know that about things that I should know because this is my, I'm a professional as a dog groomer, right? So that's why I paid and I took the course and I learned how to do it because when someone asked me, do you dye dogs? I want to be able to say, no, I don't offer that service. I've taken the course, I know how, I respect the people who do it. And you know, now that I learned how to do it properly, you know, I, I, I realize it is safe. You know, it doesn't harm the dogs or anything, but just not my thing. But I don't want to say I don't know how. Project competence, right? Put in, that, put in the effort to, to gain the knowledge so that you can show up confidently because you know that you know your stuff. Now, if they ask me about anything else other than dog grooming, I don't know, <laughs> right? That's fine. But when it's something that you have dedicated your life to, then you probably should know. Right? You probably don't want to say, I don't know, or I didn't think of that, or I didn't know that. Right? Um, when it comes to dog grooming, now when it comes to like, um, when people ask me about their dog health issues, my dog is a little bloated. I'm like, that's internal medicine. Talk to your vet, you know? But at least I know enough of when to refer my clients to the vet, right? Okay, so now get in, let's get into it. Becoming a four-leaf clover. Um, hold on. I think I saw a comment come in. Nina! Wow! Nina Shields! How are you, Nina? I'm driving and can't chat. Know that you are loved and appreciated. Yes, our attitudes are our choices. Be good in the world. Thank you so much, Nina. Wow. Um, Pam says, thanks, Jean. Thank you, Pam. Okay. So, becoming a four-leaf clover. Now, whenever somebody tells me what to do or what they think I should do, I always like to ask why, right? And if they say, because I said so, I'm out. <laughs> because I said so or because I told you to never worked for me. I don't care what position you are. I don't care what your title is. Don't. Don't tell me what to do if you don't have a good explanation of why, right? So, first of all, what is a four-leaf clover? Well, I think I've already gone over that. A four-leaf clover is special, is unique, right? Why do you think people spend time and effort pushing aside all of the three-leaf clovers to find even, I found a tiny four-leaf clover, but it was enough. It didn't matter how small it was. I found one four leaf clover where the fourth leaf was kind of damaged. One of the leaves was damaged and almost ripped apart and it was just kind of dangling there. It looked like if you blew it too hard, it might fly off. I kept it, I dried it, 
that's still a four leaf clover, even though it was damaged, right? That's the thing. Because I've become unique, at least here in Atlanta, no one else offers the service I offer. No one else does it the way I do it, at least to my knowledge. And I'm not trying to brag, I'm not trying to flex, I'm just saying. Um, but I, I am obviously damaged, right? I, I started a business, I failed. I went out west to Phoenix, Arizona, and Utah. Didn't work out, came, had to come back here. Um, you know, got, got, started grooming at a shop here, got fired the first week, right? I have a lot of, I have a lot of damages. You know, I have a lot of scars and scratches, you know, because I, I tried and failed a lot of things. That doesn't make me a loser. Doesn't mean I should be ashamed, right? At least I tried, I gave it my all. And I learned things about myself through each failure. I learned that I don't want a business anymore, one that has employees, because I am not a good um, manager. I am not good at dictating or delegating or anything like that. I don't like all that. I'm, a, I'm an artist. Right? I like to just go and do my artwork, create, because it's, it's, it's in my heart to do so. That's it. I don't want to tell someone else how to do it or why they should do it, and then go behind them and check, make sure they did it. That, to me, is a specific form of torture for designed just for me. I learned that about myself, uh, because I did have dreams of like having a frific spa was the name of my, my grooming shop, having one on every corner, in every city, in every country, you know, like, and I realize now that is not for me because that has a lot of administrative work and I'm not for that. I learned that about myself, you know? Um, I also learned that I like to blame everything other than myself with that first failure. I remember when I first sat down with my mentor, he actually, he told me like, uh, do you know why you went out of business? And I had all kinds of reasons. I was glad he asked, actually, because I had a list ready. <laughs> you know, well, I started, I opened up my, my business in the summertime. It was summer vacation. You know, everyone's out of town, you know, and taking vacation and everything. Nobody really wanted to try a new groomer that just opened up. So that's why it didn't work out in the beginning. And then it was fall. All the kids were going back to school. You know, parents are busy, you know, getting kids to go back to school and all this stuff. Oh, and then the holidays came, you know, Thanksgiving, Christmas. It was the holidays. You know, their people are busy. And then the spring came and spring break, people are on vacation again. They're trying to get back to school when they get back. Oh yeah, now here comes summer again. <laughs> I used to blame the weather, you know? It was the weather's fault. It was the economy. It was everything else. What I didn't really consider was that dogs were getting groomed the entire time. <laughs> I was making those excuses, you know? I refused to look at myself in the mirror and say, maybe this is all my fault. Right? And that's what he did. He, he told me, he was like, June, I, I know this is going to be really hard for you to hear, but maybe you should consider that the reason why you went out of business was because of you. And he was right. It was difficult to hear. It was very difficult. I remember my face turned red. I was angry. I was mad. I was embarrassed. But then I took a deep breath because I remember a voice in my head saying, when else are you gonna have an opportunity to sit down with a self-made millionaire and get advice, you know, get some help from him? You know, he's willing to give you his time and share his experiences and his knowledge and his wisdom. He's sitting, he's, he's giving me his time, which is so valuable. Like, what gives me any right to feel offended, you know? So I took a deep breath and I remember saying, telling him like, oh, all right, I'm willing to consider it, you know? Um, and that's the thing. It's like you learn something about yourself with each failure. It's okay, you know? But as you keep pushing and as you keep developing and growing in your career, don't forget to think about what it is that makes you unique, uniquely you, Right? Just like uh, Bruce Lee, he's saying, you know, develop your own style. You learn from all the different disciplines. Take what's useful, discard what's not for you, and then make your own unique style, right? And that's how it is. I think that if I, if I could give any new groomer any advice, uh, try to work as, as many different shops as possible. Try to work with as many different groomers as possible and watch and learn how they do, how they groom, and then take, 
take little bits from everyone and develop your own style. Um, and okay, so that's what a four leaf clover is, right? Why become a four leaf clover? Well, because if, you're, if you don't, it doesn't matter how big and strong you are or how much more impressive you are than all the other three leaf clovers. You're still gonna not, you're still gonna be left behind. You're not gonna be, get picked. You're not unique, you know? Um, so that's why. How? How do you become a four leaf clover? Well, there's a book called Outliers by Malcolm, Gla Malcolm Gladwell. And he talks about the 10,000 hour rule. And he's saying that um, anybody who you believe to be a success, overnight success, like the Beatles, for example, he gave the Beatles as an example because I didn't know this, but this is fascinating. He's saying before the Beatles ever played on a public stage, they were invited to a strip club in Hamburg, Hamburg uh, Germany, and they played at a strip club for eight hours a day every single day, seven days a week, for four month stretches at a time. And uh, Malcolm Gladwell was saying that by doing this, by playing together eight hours a day, seven days a week in a strip club, where people probably aren't really even that interested in your music, right? <laughs> They're not there for that. They learn how to play together as a band and how to capture people's attention, how to grab it and keep it, right? And so he was saying that by the time um, the Beatles ever came on the public stage, ever came to America and played, he's saying that they already had 12, over 12,000 performances together as a band. And he said that you can look anywhere in the world, go to any club, big club where these big bands are playing, even smaller bands, you know, he was saying you'll never find a band that has played over 12,000 times together. You know, he's saying is that many hours of practice that made them so good. They weren't an overnight success. They already played 12,000 times as a band, eight hours a day, seven days a week before they ever got famous. Mozart is another great example he brought up. He's saying everybody thinks that Mozart is such a prodigy, so, such a genius. You know, he wrote, he composed, um, you know, symphonies and stuff when he was a kid. No, I mean, he did, but none that anyone ever cared about. He's saying the first um, symphony or orchestra that Mozart ever composed, written, wrote, that, that got noticed, he was 23 by that time. He had already been composing for over 10 years, right? And he's saying 10 years is about the time it takes to accomplish those 10,000 hours of focused, disciplined practice in your field. It takes about 10 years. So it makes sense that Mozart first started composing music when he was about 10, 13. He was 23 by the time he actually wrote something that, that, that got noticed, right? So it's about the 10,000 hours. When you're at work, be at work. Focus on what you're doing. And that's why I actually stop streaming um, live while I'm working because I do get distracted by the comments because I do love interacting with people and it does take away from my focus on the, on the groom. And so now if I do stream, I send the private link to my clients so that only they can watch and the people that have that link and I don't even talk, I just groom. Um, and, and because that's, I realized, I, I started getting away, I started drifting away from what, what actually got me to where I'm at, you know? Now that I feel confident in my skills, I felt myself, I, I, re, I caught myself kind of um, being undisciplined, you know, kind of taking it easy a little bit. And I was like, that's why I'm gonna get stagnant, you know? I don't want people saying five years from now, you should have seen June five years ago. He was, ama he was amazing, now he's getting old. You know, I don't want people to say that. Five years from now, I want people to say, Holy cow, he was amazing five years ago, but you should see him now, you know? <clears throat> I always want to get better. And I remember, so here's one danger of working at grooming shops. When you're working at grooming shops and you work with different people, you'll notice that a lot of times when people go to work, they're not really there to work. They're there to socialize, tell you about their weekend, tell you about their kids and what their kids did and all this stuff. And that's fine if we're on break, if we're, on, if we're at lunch, you know, or if it's after work and I'm not busy and I don't have to leave, then yeah, let's talk. But while we're working, when you're at work, be there. Jim Rohn says, if you're, if you're on vacation, if you're in your mind, if you're, on if you're thinking about vacation when you're at work, then when you're on vacation, you're gonna be thinking about work. 
and you're gonna mess it all up. When you're on vacation, be there. When you're at work, be there. Wherever you are, be there. Fully be present. Because I remember um, when I went to the different trade shows even, and I was, I was uh, attending all those classes, Sometimes people would try to talk to me, and I know I seemed rude, but I would, I would just kind of like, oh, you know, it's, and I would just keep writing notes. And oddly enough, I was pretty much the only person, at least in my row, that I could see that was taking notes, you know? Um, and I didn't care if people thought I was rude. I was there to get that information so I can become a better groomer because this is my life. This is my profession, you know? I'm an artist. And I want to be good at it. So I was there for the information. So when people would try to talk to me during, during the, you know, the class or the, or the lecture, I, would, I wouldn't let them talk to me. I would just, uh-huh, uh-huh, you know, and then just start writing again. Because, and, and uh, you know, it's like, yeah, I didn't make a lot of friends, you know, but I got a lot of information. And it made me a lot better in my craft, in my, in my business, right? Um, a lot of other groomers that were there, they made friends. And they, they left the, the, that place with a lot of friends, not a lot of information, because what, when we listen to it, we think that we're going to remember, we won't. That's why you got to write it down. But anyways, <clears throat> um, when you're at work at a grooming shop, I remember I was at this one shop, I won't mention his name, but this guy, he would spend all day just talking to us and like, like, dude, focus on the dog on your table, you know, like. And he would try to talk to the clients when they were dropping off the dogs. He would try to make conversation with them. And you could tell. They're like, okay, uh, you know, they got to go. They're, they're dropping their dog off. They got to probably go to work. Um, and he would, like, call, uh, call you know, the, some of the men that would drop off the dogs. He'd be like, okay, chief. Okay, boss. Okay, you know, like, I don't know. Like, trying to be buddy-buddy with them. And I remember one time I was telling him, I was like, you know what? Think about Gordon Ramsay. You know, I was like, even if you were rude as fuck to the clients, if you were really good, exceptional at what you did, and they could see that, they'd be willing to put up with a little bit of your, you know, rudeness, you know? They probably just wouldn't even want to talk to you. Here, you're my dog, I'll be back, you know? Uh, and I even told him, because he would always try to talk to the owners when they come in too, show him pictures of his daughters, trying to, get, trying to get them emotionally invested in him and everything. And I just told him one time, you know, I was like, if these owner, if the owners of this this place, you know, I was like, if they ever, you know, got in a financial pan, a jam, you know, and things are tight and they have to let someone go, I was like, who do you think they're gonna let go? You or me? You know? And I was like, I don't tell them about my daughters. I don't tell them shit about my weekend. I don't even want to talk to them. Write my check. That's it. You know? <clears throat> I'm here for a job, and I'm doing a good job. You know? And I was like, you. You nick the dogs. You're not that great, you know. You still don't know how to scissor, you know. I was like, but you, you, but you're so friendly with them, and they know all about you and your daughter and your girlfriend and everything that's going on in your personal life. I was like, but who do you think they'll let go if they have to let someone go, you or me? And he was like, mm. I was like, exactly. They'll probably let you go. <laughs> and I was telling him like, even if you didn't make friends with the owners and you didn't, and they, you know, they don't even like you that much. If you come in every day and you, you pour it on and you do an amazing job and every day it seems like you're trying to do better, it would be, bad business, it would be a bad business decision for them to let you go. You're, you're helping the business make money, right? And at the end of the day, that's all they care about when you're in business. And I was like, <clears throat> you know, let's just say that you continue doing what you're doing now and you keep talking to them and whenever they come in, you try to be all friendly and buddy-buddy with them. I was like, when it comes down to deciding who to let go, they're gonna let you go because you're not actually helping their business, you know? And I'm not sure if it actually helped him or not, it probably didn't. But yeah, I remember like, I was just telling him, I was just so frustrated, I was just like, why doesn't he get it, you know? And he would try to come over to, to my table too whenever I was working, and I would just ignore him. And I would just be like, all right, you know <clears throat> And I remember one time I told him, hey, hey, I won't say his name, I won't say his name. I was like, hey, I'm all for whistling while you work, but don't forget to work while you whistle, right? I was like, we can talk, but how about you talk from over there at your table while you're working on your dog, you know? <clears throat> and it's like, and that's, I, I know it's rude, but if you want, if you care about your career, if you care about your future, 
as, as a dog groomer or any kind of professional, then you have to be rude sometimes when people are actually trying to keep you from growing in your career. That's what they're doing. Look at it for how it really is. They're trying to stop you from your personal success. And if you look at it that way, who's the one being rude here? Me telling them to go back to your table and work on your dog while, and let me work on mine? You know, like stop, <clears throat> stop this whole, you know. Here's the good thing, I remember um, Brian Tracy was saying that when you're at the office and you got that guy that's just going from de desk to desk, chatting everybody up, wanting to talk about, how was your weekend, you know? He's saying just very politely say, hey, I'm really sorry, but I got a lot of work here to do. Um, we can talk about this after I get all this done. How about you go over that to that guy and you go ruin his career? <laughs> I love that. You know what I'm saying? But I couldn't think of any other groomer in that, in, that bit, in that shop that I wanted him to ruin anyone's career, so I couldn't use that line. But it would have been nice if there was another groomer there that I didn't like. <laughs> like my friend Mario. It probably would have worked with him because we were always busting each other's chops. But anyways... Yeah, it would have been so awesome. It would have been so awesome to use that line, though. I would have been like, hey, hey, Kyle, like, hey, so-and-so, I am I got I got this dog to work on. I'm really focused right now. How about we talk after work? But in the meantime, how about you go over to Mario's table and you go ruin his career? <laughs> Anyways, um, let's see. So that's become the four-leaf clover. If you're in a shop full of groomers and they're all doing it the same way, just seven all over, shave them down, just get them done as fast as possible. Hour and a half, I'm done, you know? If you, everyone's doing it the same way. Try to be different, you know? Do the things that others refuse to do so that you can have the life and the freedom that others don't have, right? Um, let's see, now number two, communicate values, not strengths. So hopefully everybody understands number one, because that's the most important one. You got to focus on yourself. Doesn't matter if your cousin is a four-leaf clover, doesn't matter if your parents are four-leaf clovers, you know, meaning they're unique and special. Doesn't matter. If you yourself don't put in the time and effort and the inner work to find your personal unique strengths, what makes you you? What makes you so different than everyone else? Don't be ashamed of it. Be proud of it. Embrace it and really develop that and become a four-leaf clover. It doesn't matter if you're big or small, damaged, doesn't matter if you're pretty, ugly, doesn't matter. As long as you have that four-leaf clover and you are now unique and different than everybody else, you will be picked out of the crowd. People will literally search you out, push others out the way to find you. Um, number two, communicate values, not strengths. <clears throat> and I have two sub points about this. Be different, not better, because different is better. The, I got this idea, um, I was reading, I think it was the Harvard Business Journal or something, but this guy was writing about, um, which one was it? I think it was Abercrombie and & Fitch, and they were starting a new line of lingerie, and it was for kind of natural sized women, you know, women who didn't look like supermodels and all skinny. It was more for full figure, natural bodied women, um, because he was saying, you know, we didn't, we didn't want to be a, a better Victoria's Secret or a better lingerie company than anyone else. We want to be different. And it turns out different is better. And I was like, that is such a great idea. <clears throat> so I realized I don't have to have a big shop, a big business name, all this stuff. I don't have to be better than anyone. I just have to be different. And different is better. I was like, okay, well, what are some things that no other groomers are doing? Well, I know that every groomer that I know of personally refuses to demat a matted dog, a big doodle. The owners don't want them shaved. They want to keep the hair because they want like they love the fluffy dog. That's why they got a long-haired dog. But for 5 or 6 weeks, no one touched it with the comb. You know, they just kind of brushed it with a little pin brush and stuff and they think that's enough. Basically, that's like combing your hair with only your fingers, never using a comb or a brush. That's basically what it's like. You're only separating the top coat. But anyways, I know for a fact that there's probably no other groomer in Atlanta that will demat, untangle all of that and comb out all it, work it all, because it takes two, three hours, to be honest with you. Even a Bichon, it takes me about two hours to get them all dematted and combed out. 
and it takes a lot of work and I'm tired after that it's like it's like spending two three hours at the gym I would never spend two three hours at the gym sweating like that for two three hours and then wash the dog and dry them afterwards that takes another hour and now I'm four hours in and I'm sweating and I've been bending over my back hurts and now I have to do the haircut I have to dry the dog out fluff them out comb them out and then do a haircut that itself is enough for a lot of groomers because it's a lot of work to do a nice haircut. I'm doing that after I've done four or five hours of sweating. You know what I'm saying? I know how crazy that is. And I know how difficult it is because when I thought about hiring somebody, teaching them what I do, and then paying them what I get paid to do it, that's when I felt bad. I was like, oh, well, I feel bad asking anyone to do what I do because it is crazy. But for me, it's an opportunity to pour my heart into something that I care about. It's an opportunity for me to prove to myself that I'm willing to work hard for something that means something to me. To, that, to make a difference in this dog's life, in that family's life, it means something to me. Now, when I start feeling unappreciated and taken for granted, that's when I lose it and I fire them. And I let them know I'm never coming back because I know how difficult it would be to replace me. Maybe not impossible, but I know how difficult it would be. You know, and I know, I know what value I bring now because I am so different because there is not a person on this world that I can find that would be willing to demat someone's dog, take care of someone else's neglect, cover it up for them, and let them show off like they're some great dog owners. When I know in my heart they're, they're neglectful, and it's because of me that they get to enjoy that kind of shine with their friends showing off their dogs. It's because of me, because I'm willing to put in seven hours of hard labor. I wouldn't even put in seven hours at the gym even if I was guaranteed a six pack, I wouldn't do it. Didn't, it doesn't matter to me that much. But the dog, to make sure the dog's healthy and happy and comfortable because it's been neglected for so long by its own family, that to me is meaningful. It makes me feel like I made a difference. It makes me feel like a hero to that dog. Um, but anyways, yeah, be different, not better. I'm not saying that I, that makes me better than anybody. Probably makes me worse. Probably makes me insane, but I don't care. I'm not trying to be better than anyone else. I'm trying to be different. I'm trying to offer something different than what everyone else is offering. You know? Oh, no, one, no one's offering to save the coat and not shave your dog down? Okay, I'll offer it. Oh, wow, it's extremely difficult. Now I see why they don't do it. All right, I'm in. You know what I'm saying? Because we think that we want a life of comfort and ease. We think we want it to be easy. We think, we, we think that... We want to avoid difficulty, but actually, no. All the growth, all the reward is in doing the difficult things. You know what I'm saying? You do what's fun and easy, and your life will be very difficult. If you are willing to do what's difficult and necessary, your life will be fairly easy. Not easy, but, you know, because life is never easy. Because life is meant to be rewarding. And again, easy is never rewarding. Now... The second point, okay, be different, not better. You don't want to, you don't want to, when you're advertising, right, and when you're marketing on Facebook or in anything even, you want to avoid things like, we have the most experience than, you know, we have more experience than every other groomer, or we're better than, you know, other groomers. Look at the competitions that I've won. Look at these trophies that I've won. Look at, you know, the most, the most rewarded groomer or awarded groomer or the most recognized groomer in the industry, you know, stuff like that. You want to avoid those kinds of statements, those um, the, the strength statements, you know? You want to make value statements. What makes you you? What, why, what, what do you believe? I believe that dog groomers, we are the first line of defense for the dog's skin and coat health, the health of the dog's skin and coat. I believe that we have a very heavy responsibility to take care of these dogs and make sure they're not itchy, scratchy, tangled up and uncomfortable. We are preventing so many horrible skin infections and diseases by just doing a proper job and making sure we're looking at everything because if we notice something, we gotta let the owners know so they can take them to the vet. We are the first line of defense. Just last week even. Yeah, it was last week. No, it was a couple weeks. No, it was last week. <clears throat> there's a dog where I've been telling them, you know, that there's a there's a couple of loose tooth and one is really loose and snaggle and it was kind of dark around there. It looked like maybe it was infected and I wanted to just pinch it off so bad. It was just like, oh, I had to control my urge because I just wanted to just take that tooth and just pull it out. It looked like I could just pull it right out. 
But I knew from previous experience that if there is an infection and it looked like it was possible, that it, it looked like it could have, and I pulled the tooth, now I've exposed that infection right into the bloodstream, it could cause lots of problems. So I knew better. And I told the owners, you really want to have a vet look at that because even though it looks like we could just pull it out, it looks like it could possibly be infected. I don't know, I'm not a vet, but it looks like it. And so I would actually have a vet and have them give you some antibiotics, you know, and treat it. She took her to the vet um, last week and she, she texted me, she told me that I saved her dog's life. And she said that because um, the, the, it was infected and the vets pulled uh, three teeth, two or three teeth, and she has, she's on antibiotics now and she's saying, you saved her life. You know, like, amazing, right? And that, but that's the thing, I, I believe that that's our job is not just to get shave dogs down. It's, you know, we're not just dirty dog washers. It's not just wash the dog and shave them down and, and move on to the next one. For me, it's learn what this dog needs and, and give, it, give the dog what it needs, you know? Like, for me, I feel like we have to spend our lives doing something, right? Most of our, life is spent, most of our lives are spent working, right? We spend, what, the first 18 years of our lives in school, right? And for me, I started working when I was 15. But uh, let's just say, most people start working when they're 18, right? And then from 18 to what, 65, 60, we're working. Work is gonna take up the majority of your life. So I believe that we should find something that actually means something to us. You know, some, uh, some, something that we can actually pour our heart into. Because here's the thing, I, I heard from Les Brown that most heart attacks occur on Monday morning between the hours of eight and 10 because people are going to jobs that are making them miserable. Their heart can't take it anymore and it finally just gives out, right? Uh, Brian Tracy said it better. He said that if you're working a job, if you're in a job that you don't like, that's making you miserable, get out of it the way you would get out of a burning building because that's what it's doing to your life, your soul, your, your hopes and dreams, your inspirations, your ideas. It's burning it all up and you're gonna be left as, as an empty shell, you know, just a broken person because you traded your life for a paycheck, for safety and security, you know? And I remember watching this documentary. <clears throat> it was about the uh, South Pacific Islands. And one of the islands was called, um, what was it? Stevens Island, Stevens Island Wren. <clears throat> but anyways, there's these wrens, these small birds, right? They were, they're flightless on that island. And um, it was a lightkeeper that, that went to that island from England. And when he went, he brought his cat Tibbles. And his cat Tibbles, exploring the island, found a couple of these birds, these Stevens Island, wren, Stevens island wren. Brought one to his, his, his master, his owner, you know, as a gift, because that's what cats do sometimes, right? If they like you, they'll bring you their kill. So he, he takes this, this mangled up bird, and he's like, holy cow, I think this is a new species. Sends a sample back to, to, to England. And he gets word back, this is in fact a new species, can you send us a better sample? In that time, during that correspondence, his cat wiped out the entire population. So that's the thing, it's like these, what they think happened was that these, these birds originally flew to that island, but once they got there, because it was like a paradise, there's no natural predators, there's all the food they could eat right on the ground, they didn't have to fly anymore. They just didn't. And then generation after generation of living in safety and security and comfort and ease, they've lost all their natural defenses. They can't fly anymore, they're not that fast. And it took one cat, one disruptor, to come and just wipe them out. In just a period, it's just a matter of a few weeks, they were done. You know what I'm saying? That's the danger of comfort and ease, safety and security. You want, to, you want to go through difficulty and challenges because it always keeps you stronger, it keeps you sharpened, it keeps you honed and ready, right? So that no matter what comes your way, no matter what challenges, no matter what storm blows, you're able to navigate your way through it because you're strong. You, you kept yourself strong, you kept yourself ready because you did not let yourself slip 
into um, just a slumber, I guess, you know? <clears throat> um, number, okay, so then my second fact. Okay, so this, we're still on communicate values, not strengths. Be different, not better, because different is better. My second point on that is never talk bad about other groomers or clients, current or former. And I actually have made this mistake several times. Um, I talk shit about someone to their friend that I fired. You know, the only reason I'm still grooming that dog is probably because they can't find anybody else that will, that will give them a nice hand scissored fluffy haircut because they're always matted. Um, and, and yeah, and I remember they told me one time, like, can you show me how to comb? And I showed them. Feels like it doesn't matter. You know, it's not about not knowing how to comb their dogs out. It's about not wanting to do it because it's difficult. And I remember telling this one client was like, but I comb my dog every night. And I told her, if you're not sweating, you're probably not doing it right. Bottom line. But yeah, don't talk bad about other groomers or other clients. And I do that too many times sometimes. I know that because I'm an asshole and I enjoy it sometimes. I enjoy talking shit about people sometimes. When I start seeing, you know, like drama on some of these grooming sites, I'm in. I grab, a, you know, some popcorn. I sit back and read all the comments, you know, like spill all the tea. I love it because I'm an asshole. But this one I really have to watch. And I've been working on this one myself. And it really has been making a difference. When, when a client says something bad about their previous groomer, don't join in. You know, I just say, I just say, well, I, I, I really don't know, I, you know, that situation. I don't know that groomer, you know, in the, in the same situation, maybe I would have done the same thing. I don't know. You know, I try not to badmouth my competition or my, my, my clients to each other. There's one client I fired because he's such a dick. He's such an asshole. And I recognize it because I'm an asshole. And I told him, I don't want to deal with you because I'm an asshole too and two assholes are not necessary. You know, we only need one asshole. And I'm, I'm it. So I was like, you gotta go because you're a piece of shit, right? And it was because um, the, the final straw, there was lots of stuff that he did over the years that I was willing to just let go. But there was one where I just drew the line and it was, he was talking bad about one of my clients because they were no longer in a relationship. And he was not only talking bad about her, but her two daughters. And he was telling me some deep, dark secrets that nobody should know about someone's past unless that person offers that information to me voluntarily because we are you know in that kind of relationship we're in that setting and we're in we're in that conversation and they tell me that's different <clears throat> but you telling me some deep dark stuff about this person and talking shit about her daughters because you're angry with them because you're no longer dating yeah that was it I fired them. But whenever I go to my client's house, you know, the, the lady that he was talking shit about, I never bring it up. I never mention him. She knows, you know, cause she's on, she follows my Facebook and stuff. So she knows, you know, um, she knows what happened. She knows what I did, but I never bring it up. Why? You know what I'm saying? It doesn't make anything better. It makes things uncomfortable. It doesn't. And the thing is when, when I talk bad about someone else, when I talk shit about someone else, it makes me shitty. Seriously, you cannot talk shit about somebody and escape that situation without getting any shit on you. You know? Because in order to talk shit, shit has to come through your mouth and now, now you got shit on you. You know what I'm saying? I don't know. So, yeah, I, it's like, it was, it was, it was uh, easy for me to do. Because I do, I am self-righteous. And I catch myself a lot and I am judgmental and I am hard on people sometimes and so for me this one was really big um, this was an idea that really hit me hard and I'm still working on it but it, it falls in line with communicating values not strengths when I talk bad about someone else with the intention of making myself look better stronger it actually hurts me it doesn't help me at all so even just out of purely selfish motives, it's better not to talk bad about anybody because it makes me look bad too. You know? They say, um, Ralph Waldo Emerson is, is the one that said it. Ralph Waldo Emerson says, don't wrestle with the pig because you'll end up getting dirty and possibly hurt and the, and the pig loves it. You know? 
You don't yeah. wrestle around with the pig and walk away clean, unscathed. You know what I'm saying? And the pig loved it. You didn't, you know? You just, you just did the pig a favor by wrestling with it. So yeah, if, even if you have justified reasons to talk bad about someone, best not to do it, you know? Because it only will make you look dirty. You'll get dirty in the process. Um, <clears throat> number three, this is the last one. Project competence. So uh, the first sub point I have for this one is research breed beforehand. So if you're, if you're running into a new breed, let's say you look on the schedule, tomorrow you have a wired haired pointing griffon, right? Which I, ha I groomed two of them, I hand stripped them, it's amazing. But anyways, <clears throat> look, look that breed up before you go, before you groom it. Read up on the breed standard, the AKC you know, standards, the breed profile, learn about the history of the breed, you know, so that you're knowledgeable and that you know why this breed was meant to be groomed a certain way. And you have the history behind it, you know? And, you, and the thing is, when you tell somebody things about their dog that they didn't know, because they usually know more about their dog breed than you do because they researched it, that's their breed, they love it. How would you know anything more than them? But if you can find something and you tell them something about their dog's breed, their history, something, they will, they will love it. They will love it. Why do you think keychains that say Rottweiler or Pug or Boxer, they sell so much because if someone has a Boxer and they're, they love Boxers and they see a bumper sticker that says, I love my Boxer, they're buying it. You know what I'm saying? So when I, when I um, first got, got the wired hair pointing Griffons, I was honest with them. I was like, I've never... I've never groomed a wired hair pointing griffon, uh, gr wired hair pointing griffon before. I told him, I have groomed a wired haired pointing, no, I wired haired Vishla before, and I hand stripped it, but I've never groomed a wired haired pointing griffon before. And I was like, I'll just be honest with you. And I told him, this is really exciting for me. Like I would, I would want to groom this dog just, just for the experience, just to say that I have before, you know. <clears throat> but before I showed up, I did. I researched the breed. I, I researched everything about it, you know, and we had an awesome conversation that morning. And here's the thing. It's also good to ask the, the owners about their breeds because I remember um, I, was, I was in the, my, my in-laws, my ex-in-laws neighborhood out in Arizona. And one of the neighbors, they had a poodle and they were walking their poodle and we got in a conversation. I'm a dog groomer, you know. They told me something about their poodle, about poodles in general, that I just did not know, and it was so fascinating. And now I tell poodle owners, they're amazed. <clears throat> and it's the ridge, that poodle crest that, that it has, right here in the middle of their head. They have this little ridge, a bone that sticks out, right? Right in the middle of their head. And that's why they have that big poof to cover it, because if you just shave a poodle, they'll look like an alien, like with the ridge crest, like a, you know, like some, um, ocean mammal or something. Anyways, um, they, the reason why they have that bone sticking out right there, that ridge, is because a long time ago when poodles were water retrievers and they would run into the, the river and, and retrieve the waterfowl that the hunter shot, sometimes the river would be iced over. And he, he said that because it's, it is a river, when the poodle um, jumps in to get the water, you know, the, the dug, whatever it is, it will, it will sometimes get swept under the ice by the current. And because it's trapped under the ice, it can't get out, so it uses its head to bust the ice open from the bottom. It uses that ridge, and it cracks the ice, and it's able to get out of the water that way. Isn't that incredible? Like, I was like, holy cow, I never knew that. I always wondered why they had that weird line, that weird bone, you know, right across the top of the head. I learned that from a poodle owner. I looked it up and actually lots of poodle people confirmed that that's true. So yeah, like by knowing more, or not even more, but by knowing things about the breed that you're about to groom, it puts the clients, the dog owner's mind at ease. It gives them some peace of mind. Oh, this person actually knows my breed. They're, they're professional, they're, they're competent, project competence, right? One time I had a dachshund come in and I told the owner that I just read that recently at that time, this was like 
10 years ago. But I was like, I just read about how dachshunds are fearless warriors. <laughs> and I was like, fierce, ferocious, fearless warriors. And he laughed. He was like, what, made you, what makes you think that dachshunds are fearless, fearsome warriors? And I told him, because I read the breed history and they were bred by farmers to go in and hunt badgers, like help them catch the badgers. And so the, what these dachshunds would do, the reason why their, their um, legs are shaped that way, bow-legged, is because they use it to dig like that. So they dig their way into these badgers' dens, badgers. You know what I'm saying? These the badgers are freaking badass, man. They're killers. Um, so they go in there face first into the badger's den, right? The badger then bites the um, dachshund's nose. Little hot dog. I mean, <laughs> who'd have thought? Fearless. Boom, they bite its nose, and that's why the um, dachshunds don't have pain receptors in the, around their nose. You can punch a do dachshund right in the nose. I would not suggest doing it. Don't ever do it. But I'm just saying, even if you did punch a dachshund right in its nose, they wouldn't feel pain. They would feel pissed. <laughs> They'll probably be mad at you, of course. But it's not going to cause them the same amount of pain as if you punched a husky in the face. Don't ever punch any dog in the face, first of all. But I'm just saying. And... <laughs> I, I told this owner that, I was like, so the badger bites and clamps down on the dachshund's nose, on its face, on its fucking face, in a dark den, in a... That's terrifying. I mean, that situation is terrifying all by itself. You know what I'm saying? You crawl yourself into a dark hole, this fucking monster comes out and bites and clamps down on your fucking face. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm cursing too much. And then the, the dachshund pulls it out, works itself out of the badger's hole, with the badger stuck onto it, and that's when the hunter kills the badger. Isn't that crazy? <laughs> but I tell you what, that guy never took his dachshund to any other grooming shop after that, brought him to me. Why? Because I told him something about his dachshund that made him look at his dachshund a different way. Maybe with a little more respect, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Anyways, so that's my first point on projecting competence. Research the breed. Whatever breed it is you're going to groom, research it. That way, you also will feel more confident dealing with that, that breed. Portuguese water dog, for example. I used to hate grooming this Portuguese water dog. Uh, several. I, I groomed several. Oh my god, they're all nightmares. And, and you, you ask any groomer if you enjoy grooming a Portuguese water dog. The ones that say yes are the ones that learned about the breed and they understand what causes that behavior. A Portuguese water dog will bounce, will, will not cooperate. They are so defiant. They're so strong-willed and independent, free thinkers that, I mean, stubborn is not even a good word for it, you know? But once you understand this, then I approach it differently. And now I can work with Portuguese water dogs without getting frustrated. And the, the, the one idea that I learned that changed the way I looked at Portuguese water dogs and changed the way I groomed them is I was attending a class by Judy Thacker. Judy Cantu, Kent Thacker, anyways. Um, she was on the groom team, USA, and all this stuff. And I was in a mobile grooming class of hers. Not that I was ever gonna buy a mobile van or anything, but I just thought it was like business tips and advice. So I was like, I mean, I'm sure I could gain some valuable information about business whether it's mobile grooming or grooming and hey hey what i do now house call grooming but anyways in that class just randomly she started talking about portuguese water dogs and how she loves grooming portuguese water dogs and myself included a bunch of groomers we like rolled our eyes we we're like oh you know <laughs> and she laughed and she said the reason why portuguese water dogs behave the way they do is because if you think about what they were bred to do what they were bred for they were they were water dogs poor you know and the thing is she was saying that they would sometimes um carry messages and food and supplies back and forth from ship to ship and when they were doing that they're all alone out in the ocean sometimes there's sharks sometimes there's predators out there they were saying that these dogs needed to be able to be think for themselves they needed to be free thinkers independent strong-willed and determined and because they're swimming out in the open ocean from ship to ship. And she was saying that's why when you tell them to do something, they'll say, why? Fuck that, <laughs> you know? Um, they think for themselves, they make their own decisions. And that's why with the Portuguese water dog, as long as you can make it clear to them, and sometimes it takes a little work in explaining to them, but once they get it, 
they get it. They're like, all right, fine, do it. I get it now. So that's the thing. It's like understanding the breed history, what this dog was bred to do, helps us understand this dog's behavior. Once we understand why the dog behaves the way they do, then we understand how to approach it. You know, nature cannot be controlled by force. That's why I'm not a big fan of, um, you know, the groomer's helper, the groomer's harness, all of these things that physically restrict the dog, that restrain a dog. I'm not a big fan because, yeah, I feel like it's better to, I don't know. Anyways, again, <laughs> when we understand, nature cannot be controlled by force, only through understanding. And I wish I could remember who, who wrote that quote. But look it up if you, if you want to. Nature cannot be controlled by force, only through understanding. It's true with electricity. It's true with everything. You know, it's true with fire. You can't control nature using force. Dogs cannot be controlled by force. I mean, you might get them to, but it's not. A man, con a man convinced against his will is of the same opinion still. You know, it's like sometimes dogs, um, they have that learned helplessness where they just give up, and that's so sad. You know, you want a dog to willingly cooperate with you. And the only way to get, get a dog to willingly cooperate with you is you have to be 100% completely genuine. And you have, to, you have to be willing to put in that time to build that rapport with that dog. Some dogs, super easy. They'll, they'll trust anyone. Anyone with a treat, they'll trust, they love you. Other dogs, doesn't matter if you have bacon in your hands or cheese or whatever they just will not take the treat from you they just won't trust you it takes a long time you know they're a harder nut to crack you know they got a harder shell to to crack but you know every dog is different that's why it's super important to learn about dog behavior about dog anatomy dog psychology dog you know breed history these are all important things to know if you're going to be a dog groomer. I always tell people I consider dog groomers as the mixed martial artists of the dog world. You know, we're not vets or vet techs, but we do need to know when to refer them to a vet. We need to know what to look for. We need to know what, you know, the anatomy is, you know, how the skin is structured, what, you know, what the pore looks like in this, you know, what the hair shaft looks like, you know, what the follicles are doing. We need to know all of this, and, and, but we're not vets, of course, you know, we're not dog trainers or dog behaviors, but we have to have an understanding of how dogs behave and how we can work with them, how we can get them to work with us. And I learned a lot from these dog trainers out in Utah, you know, pressure and release techniques, name and explain, you know, all of these. Anyways, by learning good dog behavior, dog training techniques, it makes you a better groomer but we're not dog trainers, are we? You know, we're not dog walkers, but we, know, we have to know how to walk a dog properly in order to gain that rapport, establish that trust, and, and also set the tone. I'm, I'm the one in charge here, I'm the one leading here. You know, we have to know how to get the dog to walk with us properly. All of these things, but we're not dog walkers. So I'm saying, dog groomers, in my opinion, we really are the mixed martial artists of the dog world. Just like mixed martial artists, they're not boxers or wrestlers or jujitsu guys or, you know, kickboxers, but they have to know about all of this stuff and they have to incorporate it all into their own unique style. You know, some people are wrestling heavy. Some guys are more a punching boxing style, but they do know how to defend a takedown. They do know what to do if they get on the ground. You know, same thing with us groomers. I'm more hand scissoring, hand stripping. I'm more of that. I love feeling like I'm sculpting a dog using my hands and scissors, free, free handing, you know? <clears throat> that makes me feel like a real artist, like a sculptor, except my, my sculptures happen to be alive and moving, you know? Um, so I'm, I'm more of that, but I do understand how to shave a dog. I do understand how to do all those things. Some people, you know, they can do an entire haircut with clippers using like a really short blade and they'll just skim the hair, comb it up and they'll skim the hair. You know, hey, that's, a, that's an amazing style. Um, I, I couldn't do it. I'd be too afraid that the dog might move, you know, and then now I got to dip in the coat. Um, but yeah, it's like everybody has their own unique style. It's good to learn all these different styles and incorporate it, just like a good mixed martial arts 
um, mixed martial artist. The reason why John Jones, uh, he's he's kind of getting you know in trouble right now, but I like to use him as an example because the reason why he's able to do all these flashy kicks, these spin moves, these jumping knees, and all that stuff, the reason why he's able to do that is because he's not scared to get taken down. He's a strong wrestler, you know, and he's comfortable on the ground. So that's why he's able to do all these other flashy things. Same thing with me. I do have a, a really good understanding of dog behavior, dog psychology, and I'm really good with my scissors. So I'm not afraid of a dog trying to take me down or acting all crazy or anything. I'm not afraid of it because I know I, I can handle it. You know, and if, the do if I can't use clippers on a dog, fuck it. I'll just use scissors and just freehand the whole thing. It'll still look amazing. Anyways, <clears throat> just a little flex, you know? <laughs> <clears throat> oh man, what time is it? I just want to uh, flex real quick. Anyways, I'm sorry. Um, okay, <clears throat> so research the breed beforehand. Um, don't say I don't know to things that you should know. And we already went over that. But it just, it, it makes the, the person paying for your services feel a little uncomfortable when you say I don't know to things you should know. You know? Um... Mm. If I, was at, if I was at a dentist and I said, um, why, does, why is this teeth doing this? And he says, oh, I don't know. <laughs> I'd be like, um, you know, I'm out of here. Uh, so the um, last one here is study, practice, and teach. Part of projecting competence is studying, putting in the time to study. You know, really sitting down and studying the material, absorbing it, digesting it. And not just, not just taking in information, but interpreting it for yourself. What does this actually mean in practical terms? And then you practice it. Whatever you learn, you put it into practice. You try it out. You experiment with it, right? And then when you feel confident, then you teach the things that you've learned. <clears throat> and here's a good reason why you teach. Jim Rohn says, if you hear a good idea and you tell it to five different people, guess what? They've all heard it once. You've heard it five more times. You get the most benefit out of it. And what I've learned is that by teaching others what I know, it forces me to actually think about it. Because it's like, a lot of times, for example, I know how to get to a friend's house, but I don't know, how, I don't know the directions. I don't know the street names. I don't know actually how to tell someone to get to my friend's house. You know, I just know how to get there. <laughs> because I just, I just know the visual cues, you know, and landmarks, and I just, I just know how to get there but I don't know the street names, I couldn't tell someone else to get there, you know? So by, by teaching someone else something that you know, it kind of forces you to learn the street names, the definitions, the terms, and it makes you think about the things that you already know so that you understand it a little clearer for yourself because you have to understand it clearly before you can actually explain it clearly. And they say that if you can't explain something very simply, if, if it's complicated in your own mind and it's complicated when you explain it, Probably because you don't understand that subject <laughs> enough, you know? Someone who actually really does have a good grasp on their, on their subject, on their craft, on whatever it is they do, and they really understand it, um, they, they can explain things to a child. They can explain what they do to a child. And that's what I started doing, actually. I used that to my advantage because I have two children. So whenever I would come home and I felt like I wasn't able to actually explain to the client what I wanted. I couldn't paint the picture clear enough in their head using my words. I would come home and I'd try to explain to my daughters. And they were like five and six at the time, you know? And my younger daughter was even younger. And if I could get my daughters to understand it, then I knew, okay, okay, maybe I understand it enough, well enough now where I can try it again. I'll try to explain it to that client one more time, try to explain it a different way, you know? but. Yeah, a lot of times by teaching someone what we know how to do, it actually makes us better. It really does. And like Jim Rohn says, you teach five people something that you learned, guess what? They all get to hear it once, you get to hear it five more times. You know? That's why I was so excited to make this stream today. Because I already know, the, know, the, I know this, all, all this information. I was just excited to hear it again from my own mouth. <laughs> I'm kidding, that was so stupid. Um, Anyways, let me see if there's any questions. Um, 
Naaman Ma says, June, you absolute spit wisdom sometimes. Wow, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I'm only wise because I've made so many mistakes. My whole life is uh, just a complete mess. Um, but it's my life and it's, it, makes me, it makes it unique. It makes it uniquely mine. And I feel like, here's the thing. I remember, um, when, this was about 10 years ago when I was writing my, my goals, my journal and everything. <clears throat> I was saying, I, I, like, I wrote down that I wanted to be an inspiration to other groomers, especially newer groomers coming into the industry. Because this industry, I mean, is looked down upon um, by the public. Um, we're not really respected in the marketplace. There's so much cattiness within the industry. There's so much politics and just, it's just, it's easy to get disheartened, discouraged, and it's easy to just want to quit. And I see that a lot of times it's the people with the good hearts, with the soft heart, the caring heart, they're the ones that leave. And it's the ones that just don't care and probably shouldn't be grooming dogs. They're the ones that stick around because the money is good. But for a lot of us, it doesn't matter how much you pay us. We're not willing to hurt a dog. You know, so for me, I, when I wrote that I wanted to be an inspiration to other groomers, I thought that that when I wrote that goal down, I thought that that meant I was I needed to be successful. You know, I need to have a nice, a nice, successful shop with employees and, you know, running a successful business. I'm out there at the trade shows. I'm getting recognized. I'm, you know, all this stuff. I thought that's the way to inspire groomers. Right. Look at me. Look at me, you know. I never would have imagined that by failing my business so hard and going in debt so badly, taking years to get out of, um, I never thought I was going to get out of that much debt. Um, <laughs> you know, just failing one thing after another, getting blacklisted from the industry, basically. Nobody, nobody who's any, who actually has a recognized name in the industry, they're scared to even mention my name because if they even hint that they're cool with me, they, it might cost them some opportunities within the industry. Seriously. Like, I'm, I'm a, they, so yeah, I, I was, t I, I found out when I went down to Florida and met some groomers, I found out that a lot of these groomers that are, are pretty big name and well established in the industry, they told her that I'm the black sheep, don't hang out with me. <laughs> she actually lost her job that night because she was hanging out with me. Isn't that crazy? Um, but yeah, I just, I, I thought, okay, well, let me go ahead and scratch that goal off. You know, I'm never going to be an inspiration to any groomer because look at me, I'm a total, a total failure. Um, well, uh, the way you define success, you know, I define it differently now. The fact that I get to run my own business the way I want, I, I, I call the shots, I, I make my own schedule. I answer to myself, I fire whoever the fuck I want, you know, I work with whoever the fuck I want, I say whatever the fuck I want, I do whatever the fuck I want, whenever the fuck I want, and I answer only to myself, um, I consider that a success, because for me, what I realized about myself is I value freedom more than anything. As an artist, what more could I ask for? The freedom to do the work the way I want to do it and I always have consistent work. I always have more than enough work to do. As a freelance artist, what more could I ask for? Consistent work, and I call my own shots. I'm a success. <clears throat> but I know that in, in, the, in most people's view, in most, the way most people define success, they wouldn't, they wouldn't consider me a success. They would consider me a failure. So I didn't think I was gonna be able to inspire anybody anymore. You know, I was like, well, there goes that. I'm not an inspiration anymore. Might as well just inspire myself, right? Um, but yeah, the crazy thing is, I never would have imagined it. I never would have expected this. But groomers actually contact me and they value my advice when their business is struggling and they're about to go out of business, they contact me because I went through it. Had I never failed my business, I don't think I would be able to help people as much as I do now. You know, when they contact me and they're scared out of their mind, I know, you know, especially if you have kids and you have obligations, man. And it's so terrifying. It feels like you're out in the, out in the woods, out in the wild, 
with no shelter and no food. That's how it feels with your family. You're stranded. That's how it feels, man. And I know that. And I've been through it. I've watched my kids sleep at night, wondering how I'm going to pay for things and not being able to sleep because I'm so disappointed in myself and I'm so scared about my, how I'm going to take care of my kids. I've been through it. You know, I know how it feels. I never would have thought, I never would have expected writing that goal 10 years ago, thinking that I had to be some <clears throat> huge, you know, look at me, guys. You know, I never fail. I never mess up. Look at everything. Everything I touch turns to gold, you know. Don't you want to get advice from me? That's what I thought. No, man, it's the opposite. Because I went out there and I gave it my whole heart, man. I gave it everything I had and I failed. And I picked myself up over and over again and I rebuilt yeah I think that now people so some people a few people see that and they they get inspired by it isn't that weird <laughs> it's funny how life turns out <clears throat> but anyways it looks like uh, <laughs> it looks like I'm pretty much done there's no other questions Awesome. I have to get ready. I'm going on a date tonight. I just got confirmation. <clears throat> I'm going to go watch The Two Gentlemen of Verona at the Shakespeare Tavern. I actually would, I, I would actually, because, um, not to get into too much detail, but I really like this person that I met. She's an artist. Um, not just a painter, because she, she, she paints so, like some really incredible, unique, amazing paintings. Um, but she's an artist. And the way that Seth Godin defines an artist is, um, one, it has to have an element of risk. It has to be something that that's, uh, hasn't been done before, something that could fail, you know? That's why he says cover bands, they're skilled, talented musicians. They're not artists, though, because they're not going on stage, taking a chance, writing something new that might bomb, that might get them booed off stage. They're, right, they're singing songs to a crowd that loves that music. They already know it's going gonna, it's gonna to work, you know? He gives another example of the painters in a city in China called Dafin. They produce 30% of the, all the world's oil paintings. But you could buy the Mona Lisa there for 30 bucks. But it's not the Mona Lisa. It's a replica. It looks exactly like it, and the, that painter is obviously very skilled and talented. But they're not making something that might not sell. They're making something that no, they know will sell. They know there's a demand for it. They're not taking a chance. They're not creating something new that they wanted to create because it's an expression of their, what's in their heart. So the first um, qualification of an artist is it has to have an element of risk. It, this might not work out, you know? That feeling of, here, I made this for you. I put my whole heart into it. I hope you like it. And so they say, we hate it. Get that shit out of my face, you know? We don't like you. We don't like it. We don't like you. That's how it feels when someone says that they don't like your artwork because you put your heart into it. When they say they don't like it, it really feels like they're saying they don't like you. It hurts. It, it, it sucks, you know? But that's the risk an artist takes because we want to create something that's meaningful, not something that will sell. Now, number two is it has to be generous in nature. You can't, like, uh, what example did he give? I can't even think of it right now. But anyways, the, the work has to be generous in nature. Um, for example, when I go and I spend two, three hours combing out that dog, making sure that it's not tangled up and matted anymore, clearing out all the dander, you would be so shocked at how much dander and flakes just fly out of there. Sometimes um, when I get a really rough po patch of hair, I'll... I'll comb it out and I'll see like a pocket of just like dander, skin dust, you know, just boom, pop out, just bust out of that area. And that was all clogged up in those pores, making that skin feel tight and uncomfortable. But anyways, by doing that, by always going the extra mile, right, by doing more than what's expected of me, that's that spirit of generosity, doing what's more, doing more than what's expected, that miss, that's what makes you an artist. Michelangelo, for example, when he, when he painted the Sistine Chapel, he literally broke his back. He literally broke his back. It took him years to finish it. And he was, he was you know, leaning back like this on those you know, levers and stuff. So anyways, 
he wasn't even a painter. He's a sculptor. The only reason why he was even doing that was because they promised that he would be able to do the sculpture that he really wanted to do if he did this first. But he's an artist. So you would never catch Michelangelo say, well, fuck it, let me just get this over with then so I can go do what I really want to do. No. He said, as long as, if I'm going to do it anyways, I'm really going to do it. I'm really going to pour it on, put my whole heart into it because I'm an artist. He's not, he wasn't a painter. He was an artist. And that's why he was able to paint the Sistine Chapel. And I've never been, I'm looking forward to it, but I've heard that when you look up at the Sistine Chapel, tears come to your eyes because it moves you seeing the dedication and hard work that somebody put into all that detail. So that's the thing. The number two, the second qualification of being an artist, it has to have, this has to be generous in nature, right? When someone watches you work, let, let tears come to their eyes, the way tears would come to their eyes when they look up at the, at the Sistine Chapel. That is the spirit of an artist. Number three, it has to touch the heart of the receiver. You know, when, when, when oh my goodness, when I hear, heard um, Hugh Jackman sing From Now On, and on, in, on YouTube, they had this clip where they, it was like in this um, room when they were practicing it and he wasn't supposed to sing because he had um, stitches in his throat. Um, they had to remove like a tumor or something. So he couldn't sing. But that song moved him so much that while in the middle of the song, he just started singing. And I was moved to tears when that when I was oh man, it's emotional just thinking about it. The whole room just singing in unison. They were all into it. It was so moving. It touched me. Hugh Jackman is an artist. And when Kiala saying, this is me, for the first time in that same room, they have another clip of her, and she's like shaking because she's so scared. And she, oh man, it was just so beautiful. That is art. It has to touch the heart of the receiver. <clears throat> so with those three qualifications, this, this, one, this young lady that I met, um, I consider her an artist in, in every way. And um, we've been hanging out a little bit, we've been talking. <clears throat> and um, she, she's, had, she's been trying to catch up on a bunch of uh, a schoolwork and everything, and you know, I can't help her. <laughs> I failed accounting, you know? So um, we, you know, we, had, we originally had this um, paint, uh, not paint, this date uh, planned for tonight. But um, she, she, you know, she was saying like, I might have to cancel, you know, my plans with my friends on Sunday so she can go on the date with me tonight. And I was like, no, like that doesn't, that doesn't feel fair. I told her, your friends have been your friends much longer than you've known me. And you had plans with them on Sunday longer than you had plans with me on this Saturday. I was like, if you're gonna have to cancel with anyone, in order to get, you know, all the assignments done on time, you're gonna have to cancel with me. That's the only fair thing, you know? I was like, it sucks for me, I know, but I was like, you know, don't cancel with your friends on Sunday. Cancel with me on Saturday, you know, today. <clears throat> um, but yeah, she just texted me. <laughs> I just saw it. <clears throat> so I'm gonna go watch the Two Gentlemen of Verona. I was actually gonna go tonight um, by myself. I even told her, like, no pressure. I was like, I actually wanted to see this play a lot, actually. Because it has everything. It has comedy. It has, it's about friendship, loyalty, betrayal. And they're saying that at the end of the play, you'll, it'll give you a renewed hope for humanity. And I was like, I'm in. So I told her, like, no pressure at all. You know, like, I'm going to be completely fine. You know, like, I, I'm totally okay with going and watching that play tonight by myself. Maybe next week they're playing Macbeth. Macbeth. Maybe we can watch Macbeth next week together. But she's so sweet, man. She's been like hardcore studying and getting all her assignments done. Like, oh my God. And yeah, so looks like that's what I'm gonna do. But anyways, I, I gotta go uh, get ready now because I was not sure if I was gonna be going with her or not. If I was gonna go by myself, I was not gonna get dressed up. <laughs> For what? Um, but now that I know, um, shoot, is my hair okay? <laughs> Oh man, <laughs> anyways, <laughs> okay, I gotta make sure I'm right, you know what I'm saying? I gotta make sure I show up right with the right energy. 
Um, let's see here. Terry. Wow, Terry K from California. Thank you so much, Terry. Oh my God, it's 50 bucks. Well, that takes care of tonight's date. <laughs> Thank you, Terry. Oh my God, she says, I was listening while walking the poodles. I needed to hear something inspirational. I had to say goodbye to my 20 year old dog last Sunday. Thank you, G. Oh my God. Terry, like, oh my goodness. My dog Angel is 15 and I'm hoping she makes it to 20. I can't, I can't imagine how difficult that was for you. It probably still is. Oh man, last night um, I was walking the dogs with my mom around this neighborhood and um, Angel's just walking so slow now. And she's just really slowed down. And my mom was getting frustrated. I was like, just, just walk, you know, like just, you know. I was getting frustrated even, but then I was looking at my dog Angel, I was like, how can I be frustrated with her? You know, she's 15 years and, and like, she's going blind and deaf. She's really slowing down. But she's so happy though. She's still so happy to be with us and to walk with us and go out to the parks with us. She did so great at the dog park the other day. But my mom said something last night. She was like, it looks like it's getting close to that time. And she was like, you're probably gonna cry, aren't you? And I couldn't even answer her. I couldn't even answer her because, you know, I would have I would have started crying just just even thinking about it. But I don't know. It's like <clears throat> I remember one time when I was in Utah, I was um, you know working at the dog boarding facility place, and there's this one dog where he was just so old, and he was peeing and pooping all over himself, and. I remember like we would have to carry him out to a separate area, set him down so he can pee and poop, and then bring him back, but he would still end up peeing and pooping on himself while he's laying down. Couldn't get up, couldn't walk. And I remember thinking to myself, why don't they just say goodbye, do the right thing, you know? Take him to the vet and have them, let him go, let, let him go to sleep peacefully and say goodbye to him, you know? It's like, you know, why are they letting him suffer like this? This is no quality of life. It was so easy for me to judge and feel so self-righteous because it wasn't my dog. I didn't have that relationship and that time spent with him like they did. Now that my dog Angel is getting to that point where it's hard for her to walk, she's slowing down. Now I, I feel ashamed almost. I feel embarrassed <clears throat> that, I was, that I was so judgmental. Because I understand. <clears throat> I understand now <clears throat> how difficult it is. And maybe it is selfish. You know, maybe it is selfish to hold on a little too long to a dog. But I'd rather make a mistake because I love too much than make a mistake because I didn't love enough. And if it is a mistake to keep her around too long because I loved her so much, I think I could forgive myself for that, you know? <clears throat> but anyways, I'm sorry, Terry. That must have been really rough. <clears throat> but yeah, <clears throat> I'm, glad, I'm glad I was able to take your mind off of it for a little bit. I mean, shoot, hold up. Was my laptop not charging this entire time? Did it just shut off because it was... Sorry about that, guys. I don't know what just happened, but my laptop shut off and my phone started making an emergency call to 911 for no reason. I didn't do it. What? Okay, so now we're back up. Okay. Well, that was weird. Holy cow. Yeah, oh my God. But yeah, um, he's in a better place. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And that's the thing. It's like, I think that we, we you know, for me at least, um, when it's finally time for me to say goodbye to my dog, Angel, I think I will take comfort in the fact that, you know, she gave me some great memories. We had some great times together. You know, she, she was happy and she got to see most of America, you know? I mean, she, she drove cross country to, with me um twice you know like <laughs> she she lived up in utah for a little bit we saw the beautiful canyons together we hiked so many different trails you know like 
yeah, I could just be thankful and grateful for all the memories and the experiences that we had together and just know that she's no longer suffering. She's no longer, you know, um, yeah, having to bear all of that pain, you know, and the aches and joints and everything. So I'm sure she's in pain, but she hides it well. She doesn't show it. <clears throat> and a lot of times I'll just, I'll just uh, take the leash off of her because first of all, she's walking way too slow and we're just like, you know, walking slow motion. But when I take the lead off of her and I just walk and I don't, I don't, you know, I don't really, you know, feel bad for her or anything. She, she keeps up pretty good. I don't know if she's afraid that we're about to leave her. <laughs> Maybe she's thinking, oh no, this motherfucker's about to leave me out here. You know, like, <laughs> you know, I don't know if that's it, but she keeps up pretty good once I take her off the leash. It seems like when I have her on the leash and she feels that pulling, she just kind of like drags. But when, I, when I'm able to take her off leash, she does much better. Um, but yeah, and sometimes she'll, she'll stop for a moment and you know, I keep, I keep checking on her. But yeah, I remember one time <laughs> I was just walking in my zone on the on beautiful trails, looking around, and then I hear some running and I, I look back and it's like, holy cow, man, <laughs> she was running towards us. <clears throat> and I was like, oh shoot, sorry. I was like, holy cow, AJ, I didn't know you could run like that still, you know, but I think that she panicked. I think that she, you know, like, we, you know, she maybe stopped to smell something or take a break and I didn't notice. And we walked a little further and like, you know, out of eyesight, you know, so I think she freaked out and started running towards us because she's like, oh no, this is it. I knew they were going to get rid of me <laughs> or something. But anyways, all right. Perfect. So thank you guys so much. I hope this helps, you know, because these three ideas really helped change my life because it brought all the focus back on me. I no longer compare myself to anyone else anymore. I actually even stopped comparing myself to my old self because I felt like that's not fair either because my older self didn't read the books and we, I didn't, you know, have the experience that I have now and I haven't, you know, it's kind of unfair to compare myself now to the older me because myself now would blow the older me out the water, you know, I'm off the floor with him. Anyways, <laughs> it's not fair. Um, yeah, I don't compare myself to anyone anymore, you know, even my former self. I just try to always just do the best I can in the moment. And I realize that's the key. Now, we can't help comparing ourselves to others because it's biologically, it's in our DNA. It's how we, it's how we evolved, you know? Um, back when we were hunters and gatherers, we were usually in small communities, small groups, of, you know, and if you got outcasted, if you got kicked out of that group, guess what? Chances are you're dead. That's why it feels so scary when we feel like we're being outcasted, when we feel like we're being rejected from the group or, you know, it feels like we're about to die. But we have to just remind ourselves that that's no longer true. Sometimes being outcasted is the best thing that can ever happen to you because now you can find your own path and you can create your own path. You know, but yeah, that, it's that comparison that robs us of our joy. You might be doing well. And if you actually think of your own life and how much you've gone through, the things that you've had to overcome to get to where you are now, if you look back on it, you really could feel very proud of yourself for who you are now, what you've had to go, go through. You could feel very proud of where you've uh, how far you've come but then the moment we look at someone else and see how well they're doing and see what they're you know now all of a sudden we when we could feel proud of ourselves we feel less than we feel like we're not enough we feel like we're not doing good enough as uh, you know and that's the thing is like it seems like when you start getting into that that um that spiral that downward spiral where you're just comparing yourself with others then you're never going to feel content you're never gonna feel happy or at peace. Because even my clients, who I would consider filthy rich, you know, they live in these mansions. I mean, they, they're rich, you know? I even mentioned it sometimes, but I know you shouldn't. Um, and the people always tell me like, don't, don't like point at people's stuff and like ooh and ah and gawk and stuff. It makes them feel uncomfortable. Well then don't put that kind of stuff in front of me. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> don't have that stuff out in your house if you don't want me to point at, point at it and like, oh my God, <laughs> freak out about it. You know, cause I will, and I'm gonna make it uncomfortable. Cause I have no chill. I don't know, I don't have a poker face. 
Um, but anyways, I remember saying to one of my clients, like, you guys are so rich. <laughs> And, and they're like, oh, no, we're, you should see so-and-so, you know, we're not rich. And that's the thing. You're never going to feel like you're enough if you're always comparing to others. Because there's always going to be someone that's richer than you, better than you, more successful than you, more popular than you, prettier than you. You know, who cares? That's them. And you're you. And I'll end with this. It's my favorite quote from my favorite book, Psycho-Cybernetics. Malcolm, Mal Malcolm Maltz, Maxwell, Maxwell Maltz. He was actually a plastic surgeon and he wrote this book about psychology because he realized that even after he fixed this woman's nose, she was complaining that she still looked ugly, that she, in, her nose looked beautiful now. She looked beautiful, but she couldn't see it in the mirror, you know? And he was realizing that it didn't matter so much what he fixed on the outside if on the inside they still saw an ugly person. He couldn't fix that. So he wrote this book, and in that book, I highly suggest reading it or listening to it if you do Audible or you know, if you listen to audiobooks. But in that book, this one line that really hit me, you are neither superior nor inferior to anyone, to anybody. You're simply you. And I love that line because it is so true, so obviously true that nobody can actually disagree with it. Nobody can debate it unless you're a contrarian and you're just, you know, disagreeing just to be disagreeable. But th that's such a true statement. You are neither inferior nor superior to anyone. You're simply you. And I'm simply me. And he says, the best part about being you is you don't even have to try. If you find yourself thinking too hard, trying too hard to be somebody, to be you, you're, you're, he's saying you're not being authentic. He's saying you're not really being you because it shouldn't take effort. It shouldn't take that, what, you know, what, what do I need to do to fit into this? It's, it's almost like if I asked you guys, how should I talk? How should I make these videos so that you'll like it more, so that you'll like me more, so that I'll get more subscribers? How about fuck that? How about I say whatever the fuck is on my mind, right? And I make whatever the fuck kind of videos I want and the people who like that will find me. How about that? You know what I'm saying? <clears throat> so, yeah, he's saying that you just be you. And here's the secret of how easy it is to just be you. He says, just do what comes naturally. <laughs> Doesn't mean you're not going to make mistakes. Doesn't mean you might, you might have to apologize for a few things. But at least it was you and at least you're being authentic and genuine. You know, yeah, you might step on some toes. Yeah, you might offend some people sometimes and apologize for it if it was unintentional. But that's the thing. You are neither superior nor inferior to anybody, so stop comparing. Why compare? It's useless, you know? Just be you, and how do you do that? Don't think about it, don't try, just do what comes natural. Oh, ma. Oh, my mom is checking on me. Asking me what if I'm hungry, if I want to eat. I told her I cooked. I already cooked myself some lunch. Anyways, I got to get going. Uh, but yeah, that's what I want to leave you guys with. You know, don't compare. Don't, you know, just be you. And the trick to being you is just doing what comes natural. You know? Okay. So enjoy your day. Have a blessed day. Awesome. Thanks, guys. I am actually rambling now. So yeah, thanks, guys. Let me go see what my mom really wants. I doubt she came in here just to check and see if I ate or anything. So now that she knows how famous I am, I'm going to go downstairs and I'm going to say, hey, I, I'm going to need you to check your tone when you talk to me from now on. Did you just see what I was doing? Do you, do you have any idea how famous I am? Do you know who your son's become? You know, you better talk to me different. <laughs> I'm kidding, because she could still dropkick me. Anyways, I'll see you guys. <laughs>